Fire Emblem, Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light was released on April 20th, 1990 in Japan. It has never received an official Western release, and although a number of fan translations exist online, only the truly dedicated can be said to be very wise about the game. For this video, I played through it nearly three times over, and although there is a layer of Famicom-era mechanical limitation, extreme punishment for failure, and very complex leveling and character value systems to learn, I would never say that my time spent experiencing the debut title in the Fire Emblem series was wasted at all. Whether that time would be a waste for others is a different sort of question, leading me to the crux of this video. Would I recommend anyone else actually go back and play this game? Oof. What? Oh, shit. No! Damn it, Gordon! Okay. <sighs> I didn't really like Gordon. <laughs> That's a complicated question that requires a complicated answer. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I'm going to take a step back and take a broader look at this game in its own context. Perhaps through the explanation of the kind of experience that lies waiting here, you just might be able to make up your mind for yourself. For the purposes of brevity and simplicity, I'm going to be simply referring to this game as Fire Emblem Dark Dragon for the rest of the video. This is partly to shorten the name, and also to draw a distinction with its second remake from 2008, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon for the DS. The history of Fire Emblem Dark Dragon is also the history of its developer, Intelligent Systems. As far back as the mid-1980s, Intelligent Systems lended its programming support to many Nintendo classics, the most prominent of those being the original Metroid. By all accounts, the support lended to many of their early works was minimal, with the first game that they are solely attributed to being Soccer. That's it. That's the name of the game. Just Soccer. Soccer wasn't the only single-word titled simulation game that Intelligent Systems had a hand in making, with others including tennis, baseball, and golf. The development of the game that would become the first Fire Emblem began in 1987, as Intelligent Systems started to turn away from creating simulation games, with designer and writer Shouzo Kaga conceiving of a game that combined the strategic elements of a previous game by Intelligent Systems, Famicom Wars, with the elements of a role-playing game such as 1987's Final Fantasy, or the 1986 classic Dragon Quest, both of which were incredibly influential in Japan and the West. The result of this mixture was Fire Emblem Dark Dragon, which included the creation of a hero who has now become iconic of the series, Marth. Before I go into the story of this game, as a warning, there will be full spoilers. And perhaps more critically, while the overall thrust of the narrative is pretty straightforward, the extreme speed at which Marth goes from place to place around the entire continent can make it sound like a bunch of place names and people being thrown at you in all too short a time. I've done my best to make it a bit more understandable, but if you want to avoid spoilers or some head scratching, go ahead and click to the timestamp on screen right now. Also, as another quick note, there are a lot of different translations for the places and names that I'm going to be talking about, so I'm just going to use the ones that are on my map and were actually used in the translation that I played. Alright then, let's go. One hundred years before the events of the game, Akania, which is our setting for the entire game, was invaded by the Durhua Empire, led by the titular dark dragon Medius. Marth's ancestor, a young man named Anri, used the Holy Blade Falchion to destroy Medius, and a century of peace began. Two years before the start of the game, Medius was revived by an evil sorcerer named Garnef, who was in control of the mage country to the northwest, Kadain. With the Dark Dragon revived, the Durhua Empire and Garnef's Kadain allied with the western kingdoms of Grunia and Macedonia and waged war to take over the continent. Marth's father, King Cornelius of Arisha, took up Anri's sword, the Falchion, to battle Medius once again, leaving his two royal children, Marth and his sister Elise, in the care of the allied kingdom of Gra. Unfortunately, everything goes wrong when Gra betrays their ally, resulting in King Cornelius being killed, the Falchion being lost to the enemy, and Marth and Elise being attacked. In the struggle, Marth's sister sacrifices herself to be captured so that Marth can escape, which he does so accompanied by only a few knights. Among those include his most loyal of all, the veteran knight Jagan. The young Marth is able to find shelter in the far eastern kingdom of Talus, which is ruled by a kind king who is accompanied by his daughter, the Pegasus knight Sita. Living two years in exile from his home, the game begins with Marth at the age of 16, determined to finally set out on a journey to reclaim the Falchion, his sister, and his home. <laughs> 
This actually begins when Talos is suddenly invaded by pirates, against which Marth leads his knights, along with Princess Sita, to fend them off. With some encouragement from the King of Talos, Marth finally leaves alongside the princess. Though many different types of battles will play out through the total of 25 missions, the most important ones happen when Marth arrives at a major location and liberates it, bringing new allies into his group with every step. This results in his group slowly beginning to be called the Liberation Army, and after gaining a few allies in the mountains east of his initial destination, such as the skilled swordsman Navar, Marth's first major accomplishment on his journey happens within Orleon. Alongside the local Duke Hardin, who is actually an important character in the later remakes, Marth is able to liberate the country of Orleon and find the princess of a separate kingdom being held within, the Princess Nina of the large kingdom of Akania, the nation which also shares the name of the entire continent, and it is Nina who then grants Marth the Fire Emblem. In this game, the Fire Emblem is mostly just a symbol of Marth's authority, and is a rallying cry for his army. It is from this point on where you start to feel his legitimacy precede him. Commanders will curse at the arrival of his army, and usually suffer due to their poor leadership and cruel management before being crushed by him. Along the way to his next destination, which is Nina's homeland of Akania, Marth encounters a frustrated Princess Minerva of Macedonia on the battlefield, although she quickly abandons the front line, frustrated by the local commander's incompetence. Minerva then sends a secret message to Marth, explaining that she only serves Durhua due to her younger sister Maria being held as a hostage in a prison nearby. She implores Marth to set her sister free, and explains that until he does, she will have to continue to pretend to be against them. Although the others are suspicious, Marth decides to trust Minerva, and after rescuing her sister, Minerva stays true to her word and swiftly joins his side. This doesn't add much army strength to Marth yet, as her and her sister are basically outcasts from their homeland, which is still ruled by their cruel brother. But Minerva, alongside her allies the White Wings, Pegasus Knights, Katria, Pala, and Est, who are Ciri's staples, are some of the most skilled and renowned warriors in the continent. With the princesses of Macedonia freed, and with his several new powerful allies, allies, the group finally heads to Princess Nina's homeland and liberate it together. Marth and company next travel to the small country of Gra, the kingdom which betrayed his family and ultimately was responsible for his father's death. He hopes that he will be able to find the falchion here, but after liberating Gra, the holy sword is still nowhere to be found. Luckily, they are able to deduce that Garnef is the one who took it after his father's death and head to the land of Cadain to confront him. Arriving in the Magic Land, they are able to encounter Garnif, but find that he is completely untouchable due to his incredible magical power. Forced now to retreat, Marth is surprised to be suddenly telepathically contacted by the powerful sage Goto, who informs him that only the power of a magic called Starlight can take on Garnif's own dark magic. In order to gain this power, Marth must obtain the orbs of Star and Light and meet Goto personally in Minerva's homeland of Macedonia. Before setting out for this, Marth and company head south to his own homeland, the still subjugated land of Arisha. At long last, he liberates it, and while praising his beloved allies who got him this far, they soon discover that Princess Elise, along with the Falchion, is also being held captive by Garnef. With even more pressure to confront the Dark Sorcerer as soon as possible, they immediately head west to the Thane of Raman, a holy sanctuary where many treasures are being held by the Divine Dragon tribe, including the orbs that Marth is seeking. It is here where a trap is laid for him, utilizing the brainwashed princess of the Divine Dragons, Tiki. With the help of her grandfather, Bantu, one of Marth's allies who had been seeking his granddaughter since near the start of Marth's journey, Tiki is brought back to her senses, and Marth gains an incredibly powerful ally in her, at the same time as retrieving the two orbs that he needs. The only thing that remains between him and gaining the power of Starlight are the countries of Grunia and Macedonia, which he fights through, first by besting the sympathetic Grunian general Camus, who had set Princess Nina free and was loved by her, followed by the completely unsympathetic Michaelis, Minerva's evil brother who is finally taken down here. While in Macedonia, Marth finally meets face to face with Goto, who creates the magic of Starlight for him. With this in hand, he speeds back to Cadain and confronts the sorcerer Garnef in his tower, and by using the magic to finally defeat him, Marth obtains the Mystic Sword Falchion and reunites with his sister. With all other countries of the land liberated, wielding the Mystic Sword Falchion, and accompanied by his numerous powerful allies, Marth, who is also known as Star-Lord Marth at this point, arrives in the remains of the Durhua Empire, and after cutting through the near-endless dragon army, defeats the seemingly unkillable Dark Dragon Medus in his stronghold. 
As the many allies who joined Marth's Liberation Army during what had been three years of war go off to continue their lives, Marth and Sita settle down in his homeland and declare their love. As the people now set their minds to reconstruction instead of war, it's a happy ending for all. And despite this adventure being rather epic in scale, spanning multiple cities and kingdoms, this is overall a pretty simple story. Unfortunately, the way that I told it is not the way that the game tells it. This story summary which I just went through was put together from my own experiences with the game, this very handy map which I wish could have found some kind of representation, and a whole lot of research. For those who don't look this up before they begin to play, the only story to go on in-game mostly happens just at the beginning and end of chapters, where you will get a sudden burst of text from somebody with little time for elaboration. I assume that this is due to the era in which this game released. Introductions to these characters are meant to be done by looking through the instruction manual, and it is assumed that if you are playing the game, you already took the time to look up where the places you're going to be traveling to are in relation to each other. I had no idea what was going on for most of my playthroughs, and it was only in the writing of this video that I could start to retroactively put what I had experienced together into a coherent order of events. All things considered, the journey Marth takes does make sense, with just enough twists placed in it to keep him from taking too direct a path to his goals. Even though he is mainly going from important place to important place and slaughtering commanders, there are a number of missions which take place outside of the main plot locations, where Marth just has to fight through the resistance which is mustering against his own actions. Which actually does give his journey a kind of friction, and makes it into an interesting struggle once it is finally understood. Overall, I have to call this plot a success, but there is a huge disparity between what is written and what is actually delivered. I have no doubt that this is certainly an area which later games will fix, and I'm also especially interested in seeing how this game's own two remakes handle in delivering it. While the characters Marth meets in this game are many, of which several will go on to be icons for the franchise, in reality, in this plot, outside of Marth and Nina, there is actually very little character development to go around. This is mainly due to the harshness of these battles, and the severe consequences that you can suffer for carelessness, or in some cases, a simple lack of foresight for the tricks that the game is going to throw at you without mercy. Though you may come to treasure some of your soldiers, mostly due to their stats and rarely from their simple personalities, when they fall in battle, they are gone forever. Literally the only character whose death can cause a failure state in the game is Marth, and any particular soldier that you intend to keep through all your battles had better be tough as nails and experienced. As such, it is much wiser to pick a consistent team of heroes early on, and level them exclusively in order to make them as tough a squad as possible. And although they will never be death-proof no matter how much you grind, due to the prevalence and devastation of critical attacks, three or four extremely high-level soldiers can be way more destructive than ten low-level characters due to this game's battle mechanics. Each mission will generally play out like this. Before a battle starts, you will select 10 or sometimes more soldiers in your army to bring with you into the fight. You can scan the battle ahead of time to get a sense for which characters to bring, however, there isn't much to think about here in terms of weapon matchups. This early in the series, there is no basic weapon type that has an advantage against any other. For example, swords do not counter axes or anything of the sort. Once the battle begins, you can move your soldiers around one by one, although the space that they can move isn't displayed to you, and instead must be kind of felt out by moving the cursor as far as it can go. This might seem appalling to modern Fire Emblem players, and may in some cases cause them to instantly turn away from this entry, but I was surprised to find out that this is really not as big a deal as I thought it was going to be. With this game's rather limited number of classes, it actually isn't very hard to quickly understand how far each character can go, and as soon as the third mission, I had already personally gotten a feel for it. Even in modern games, you still need to click on an enemy or ally to see how far they can move, and the only real difference here is that just a little bit more is now done in your head. After moving a unit within striking range of another unit, you can attack them with any weapon in their 4 item inventory, with damage being inflicted based on your unit's power, the weapon's strength, and the enemy's resistances. Your accuracy is based on the kind of weapon that you're using, and modified by the terrain that the target is currently standing on. The most accurate kind of melee weapon is the sword, and others, like the axes and spears, hit harder but are less accurate. The different types of terrain which will help the target's evasiveness range from the basic plains, which has no evasion advantage, to forests, hills, or even open water. 
While Dark Dragon does not have a classic weapon effectiveness chart, the few special weapons do kind of serve as one, giving you enhanced damage against specific types of units. These weapons include things like the Dragon Sword and the Night Lance, among a few others, and though they do give a strong advantage early on, they can sometimes feel a bit underpowered as the missions go on and your enemies get stronger. These weapons and others can be obtained in a number of ways in the game, either through enemy drops or by buying them in specific shops that are represented on certain battle maps. Inventory management for your character's weapons, spells, or items is a very important aspect of this game, and also one of its weakest. In order to get into why, I'm going to have to first establish a little bit of context. Battles in this game are where absolutely everything happens. There are 25 missions in total, and from the moment you start a new game and are thrust into the first fight, you will never move a character or access a menu that isn't inside one of these missions. There is no way to adjust your equipment or items prior to a battle, and you can't manipulate manipulate the items a character is holding when a battle finishes unless you choose to take them into the next battle. On top of this, buying, equipping, trading, and dropping items are all actions that take up turns during a battle, and when it comes to buying items, only the character who's currently standing on a shop is able to buy from it. What this means is that once you have found your first shop that would allow you to buy stronger weapons, the most efficient way to fill everyone's four inventory slots with items from that shop would be to set up an actual queue line mid-battle, although ideally this is something that you do either as soon as the battle begins in the rare times where you start out by a shop, or at the end of the battle, after you have already defeated all enemies and captured all the forts, which may leak reinforcements while you get your item management done. How it actually plays out is a nightmare. When you're ready to shop, you send any characters that you want to make purchases to make the ideal queue line. Then you'll send your first shopper into the shop square, and potentially use their action to drop any weapon or item that you no longer want to keep. Then you'll need to end your entire turn, where the enemy's turn will likely pass with no action. And when the next turn begins, you'll have your chosen shopper use their action to buy any items that you want them to have. They then cannot move from the shop once that action is finished. So, you have to end your turn again, let the enemy turn pass again, and then move the first shopper off of the shop square. You move the next shopper onto the shop, and then repeat all of this again. For every single character that you want to hit up the shop. Thinking of ways to handle your shopping or item distribution is a very important early game decision. One way that I recommend trying out is to use high mobility characters such as Pegasus Knights as a delivery man or delivery woman. You give them no items to hold and simply use their opened up inventory slots to buy weapons or items for the other characters, and use their mobility to deliver them to your units throughout the battle and then head back to the shops. In my second playthrough, I basically used one of my characters as a personal Amazon Prime, and although it did cut out on a lot of shopping queues, even this method was not efficient enough to fully avoid them. There's really no way around it. This system of item management is a chore, and I mean that in the literal sense. It is the thing that you have to do in order to keep the game working for you, just like you have to throw out trash regularly at home to keep it from piling up and stinking up the whole place. As bad as this is, it actually isn't the largest hurdle that one has to overcome when it comes to enjoying this game. That honor goes to the game's undoctored run speed. I'm not quite sure how to say this without coming off as an impatient modern gamer, so maybe I'll try to head this off by giving some of my qualifications first. I began gaming in the early 90s, and I grew up especially loving JRPGs, starting from my elementary school days. My first RPG was Final Fantasy IV for the Super Nintendo, and my first Pokemon game was Blue. In my frenzy to get my hands on more JRPGs, I played through re-releases of the original three Dragon Quest games on my Game Boy Color, and I played through the original Final Fantasy games when they were released on the PlayStation 1 in the Final Fantasy Origins collection. The point that I'm trying to make here is that I am not a stranger to slower-paced RPGs, and in general, I'm a pretty patient person. However, I am simply not patient enough for 50 hours of this. What you're seeing right now is the game's original run speed. The faster paced footage that you saw previously was the game running with a frame skip mode activated in Virtua NES, making the gameplay roughly twice as fast as usual. Everything in this game feels as if you're taking a modern tactical RPG and playing it at 50% speed. And let me again stress that on top of this, this is not a short game whatsoever. On my first playthrough, I played through the first five battles of the game at its intended speed, 
each of which took me about an hour to beat. As the game goes on, the battles get longer and longer, culminating in the final battle, which if done without going on a mad dash to the end while ignoring casualties, can drag on for nearly two hours, even at double speed. For most wanting to experience this game today, this situation results in a hard decision to make. Even with the item management issues, there is an excellent, although severely aged, tactical RPG experience to be had here, but nothing can save a tedious experience. Turning up the speed of the game makes it play in a similar fashion to a modern Fire Emblem, but the severe downside of this is that while you are increasing your own satisfaction, you will be absolutely murdering this game's excellent soundtrack. This is definitely a real shame, because there are some very memorable and catchy tunes to be heard here, the strongest of which to me is of course the classic Fire Emblem theme. Often, as I sat down with this game night by night to play, I would linger a bit too long on the opening menu, drawn in by the joy and encouragement that this track would inspire in me. Afterwards, I'd have to feel a bit sad before turning the game speed up and turning the sound off just so that I could enjoy myself. If you do decide to play the game with the speed up, I definitely recommend turning on the game's original soundtrack on a different device nearby while you play. Or if that's something that you can't do, maybe you can just take a moment to slow things down occasionally so that you can still enjoy the classic sights and sounds of this game together as they were originally intended. While most players' first challenge with Fire Emblem Dark Dragon is the struggle to find a way to make an enjoyable time out of it, with an understanding of this game's faults, as well as an appreciation for the wellspring of new ideas it brought to the table, on a Nintendo console, it's really hard to come away too negative on the whole experience. My early nights playing the game were a rough couple of hours, and as the battles dragged on even at 200% speed, I questioned whether I really wanted to keep on proceeding through such an aged experience. However, when I decided to play the game again for a second time so that I could record it for my Let's Play channel, I found myself eagerly anticipating coming back to it time and time again, as there's definitely some kind of primal enjoyment to be found simply by having the fortitude that it takes to conquer the game and navigate its immense challenges. This second playthrough, where I managed to successfully beat it without a single recruited character's casualty, kind of, was immensely satisfying to pull off. Wand, oh, there we go. Gordon! Come back! You useless burden! He's still holding his, his messed up bow gun that he started the game with. Oh, I'm happy to see you, actually. Other than the final two battles, where the RNG and the inability to choose where your characters start out in a fight turned some of that fun into frustration, on the whole, I still came away from this Fire Emblem 1 experiment very pleased. The question remains, would I recommend anyone else to actually go back and play this game? The answer, in most cases, is gonna be a no. Unless you're someone like me who is foolishly devoted to playing through every single game in a long-running series first before allowing themselves to touch the newer stuff, I think it's safe to say that you can skip this whole experience. If, however, you just want to experience Marth's adventure for story or curiosity reasons, while I haven't gotten to them myself, remember that both Fire Emblem 3 Mystery of the Emblem for the Super Nintendo and Fire Emblem 11 Shadow Dragon for the DS are remakes of this one, and apparently have additional content on top of that. I think it's fair to say that if the developers think the game is so far out of date that they have already made two remakes of it, it might be safe to give this one a buy. On the other hand, if you want to play this game out of a kind of archaeological curiosity, playing through the first couple levels at this game's original pace can be a pretty eye-opening experience. Fire Emblem Dark Dragon was extremely influential back in its day, leading to a series which still remains beloved nearly 30 years later. In its time, with less competition back then for a player's attention, a slow-paced tactical battle was still an hour away from the real world, as you got lost inhabiting the role of a fantasy battlefield commander. It's really not a bad way to spend a few hours. Who knows? You might even find yourself getting determined to best it, just as I did. As for me today, I have more than a few hours to spend getting to know the second Fire Emblem adventure. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us to a new continent, and on to two brand new heroes, Alm and Celica. Be sure to join me next time as I explore the black sheep of the franchise, Fire Emblem Gaiden, for the Famicom. Thank you for watching.